by the grace of God, we take our cue again from Luke chapter 13 today. And we dwell on another parable that Jesus Christ gave. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through to 9. Luke chapter 13, I will read from verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of, this, of his vineyard, Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does he use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And it, if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. And that is what God will have us discuss today. The title of the teaching today is Divine Expectation. From that parable that Jesus Christ said, we can see that God is actually the planter of the vineyard. And uh, the vineyard dresser is Jesus Christ. That's why it's called the shepherd. He's the keeper. He's called the keeper. And he's the one making a plea to say, you know what? We have put so much into this. Can we, can we give another year? Can we... A rapture would have happened, but Jesus Christ is making a plea, striking a deal with the Father, saying, can we give another year? Can we, can we give another year? Can we do some other things? Can we give some giftings again? Can we release grace? Can we give them apostles like Pastor Toye, that we teach them the word and trust that something will happen, that they will do things differently. So that's why we are seen today by the grace of God that not only we, are looking forward, or we are not the only reaper of goodly harvest. Also, God is looking for goodly harvest. God is a wise investor. Every impute he has made is actually looking out for output. And that's why we see in this parable that he has come back to say every year he's coming around to check how fruitful has this tree been, how yielded has this my investment be. And he says to the why is he wasting the resources? Let's take it out. Let's give these same resources to somebody who will bring increase, who will bring harvest. And uh, from what we have been taught and also from our mission statement as a church, every church has these same five purposes or five responsibilities. Number one is to exhort. Number two is to evangelize. Number three is to encourage, or we call it express. Number four is to edify, and the last one is to empower, or another people, another set of people, we call it equip. Every mission of every church is actually rooted in these same five things. And in this church, that's exactly ours also. We are positioned here by God to exalt and magnify God through worship. We are to evangelize the lost, to encourage people by expressing tangible love of Christ through the act of love and mercy. We are also to edify believers to become mature disciples of Christ Jesus. Also to empower believers to reign in life by the in-depth teaching and preaching of God's word. So everything we do in Dominion International Center towards racing pay setters and role model is actually channeled through this course. And if you look at it, the first one on that list is actually to exhort. And that is the place of you living a life of intimacy, worshiping God, in worship, in prayer. And the next one that is extremely vital, after you have been brought to the place of having connectivity with God, you can assess God in worship, you can pray. The next most important thing is to evangelize, is to evangelize. And that's why I always like to say salvation is a gift, but with it has come a responsibility to evangelize. I like to tell a story of a, a particular territory that was invaded, and all the people, all the people in that particular settlement were taken captive, and one of them finally came from nowhere and he said, "No, I will deliver them." And he did it in such a way that he was able to successfully bring one person out. And he said, "You know what? Every other person is still in this bondage." If I've done everything, lay my life on the line to bring you out, then join me, I swear, to pull out one more person. So to, that person joined, and he pulled out another person. And before you know it, they became three. No, now force is increasing, and they pulled out more people, and they kept doing that. But a time came where people felt like, ah, thank God I've escaped from this rot. 
Me, I'm not part of it. I don't care. Look at enjoyment here. And they abandon the business. And what happened eventually is that the person who lived his own life down felt like he has actually wasted time. Because for you and for me, we are actually being snatched out of hell. Jesus Christ was the one who went all the way to hell. He went to pay the price. It was, it was such a divine, it is divine risk. When Jesus Christ was hung on the tree for the first time, the Bible said there was darkness in the entire heart. Why? The light of the world was put out. Even God himself couldn't look at Jesus Christ. It was such a divine risk. He looked away just because he wanted to rescue us. And after he has rescued us, he has now said to us, you know what? I've done this for you. You need to join me in doing this same assignment. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And for the sake of understanding or clarity, I would like to read from the message version. If you can put it up on the message version, I will appreciate. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 20. I read, our firm decision is to walk from this focus center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. No matter who you are, as long as you are a human being, you are a sinner. You are not a sinner because of what you did or what you didn't do. But if by virtue of the fact that you are human, you are already a sinner. So every man is in the, the same boat. And I'm saying that to wake our consciousness to the fact that no matter what they drive, no matter what they wear, they need Christ. They need Christ. That put, that put everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrection life, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. So I don't have to look at this person and say, he's always frowning, he can go to hell. No. He said, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where New King James Version, if any man is in Christ, is a new creature. But the, what's it called? the message version is saying, anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. It's created new. The old life is gone. A new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him, and then called us to settle our relationship with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And look at the next line. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. God is said to encounter his people again in Divine Encounter 2022. And he said to us from this scripture that he has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We are Christ's representative. God uses us to persuade men and women, not angels. God is using us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We are speaking for Christ himself now. So, that people can become, with, become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. We can see from this passage that we have the responsibility of going out to tell people what God is doing. Beginning from this year's Divine Encounter 2022, we have that responsibility. The world can do practically most of the things that the church is doing. We give food out. Eastern Food Bank will do a better job because they have more access to the food. Are we building schools? Oh, I'm sure Big Gate is putting computer in everybody's desk. So there are several things we are doing, which is good. That is, give us a, an hero to people's life. But beyond that, how many of these philanthropists putting $1 billion into charity work 
will tell somebody that Jesus loves you. If the church will not do that, that is one primary assignment that every other person that is out there doing good work will not do. And that is what God has actually committed to our hand. I said, as our Father and the Lord have taught us, if you reduce the altar to a motivational platform where we motivate people, Tony Robbins will do a better job. In fact, if you put Barack Obama on the stage, I'm sure he will do a good job. But we did tell people that there is a rescue for their soul. Several people are heading for hell on a daily basis. And God is saying, that is the assignment that I've reserved for you as my church. Because you are the one that I've saved. You are the one I've snatched out of the jaw of death. And I laid the responsibility on you to go out and snatch another person. I want you to know, no matter how Many times we feed people. There are well-fed people in hell. Do you understand? So if you are all about, look, don't let people go hungry. They can be well-fed and still go to hell. They can be very educated. I've seen smart fools, as in they are looking good, looking sharp. I've seen professor actually tying red clothes and following a man called Guru Maharaji who claimed that he's God. And he will tell him, sit down on the floor. Do this flower, and he was doing that. So it's not about the status that they be in the society. If we not, we do not tell them that there is a way out of their predicament. I tell you the truth: no other person will do that. We are God's main men and women to deliver the good news of forgiveness and redemption. The world is groaning. Whether we like it or not, Pastor Omiya made us to understand this, and it's an absolute truth. That we cannot pray away end time prophecy. It will get darker from here. You know why? Because the coming of the Lord is drawing near. He says lawlessness will increase. What is lawlessness? People will lose restraint from evil. In other words, they lack control of not doing evil. It will get worse. It will get darker. But the good news is the fact that the Bible calls us the light of the world. So if it's getting darker and we are the light, then we have no fear at all. We have no fear at all. It's only for us now to begin to see how we rightly position ourselves and make sure that no darkness survives around us. Not in the city of Houston. Not in the state of Texas. Not in the United States. Because God has positioned a beacon of light in Dominion International Center. Most times we are comfortable talking about politics, sports, and government issues. And we just feel so awkward talking about the fact that Jesus loved their perishing soul. But the truth of the matter is this. These same unbelievers, they are very comfortable talking about vulgar words around us. But we have the word that can rescue their soul. And we are keeping it to ourselves. I want you to know that the easiest way to do it is to tell the world that you have a solution to their desperate need at a price that they can afford. You know how much it will cost them? It's free. It's free. It's free. Tell them you have what they desperately need at a price they can afford. So I want us to quickly look at a few things. Why do we need to evangelize? Number one, it's a divine command. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus Christ said, go. That's not a plea. Neither is it a request. It's a command. Go. Go. Go into all the world and make disciples. So, the first thing is, is a command. Also, the church is commissioned to evangelize. From the passage we read in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 14 to 20, we can see that clearly, that he has given us the task. We are commissioned. The work of reconciliation, reconciling man to God. He has given that same assignment to us. So number one is a command. Number two, we are commissioned to do that. Number three is a privilege to rescue the lost soul. Because for the fact that you are stepping out to rescue the lost soul is the fact that you have been rescued yourself. So it's a privilege that we must never take for granted. Evangelism is more than just a responsibility but a great privilege to rescue a life from eternal damnation. To bring joy to a family. You know what I was thinking about this? I just imagined the person who led me to Christ. Before I came to Christ, I was a very stubborn boy. 
I, I don't take no for an answer. And when I tell you this is the way I'm going, even if I will meet death along my path, I'm ready to go. I always tell myself, people don't die twice after all. So if I die once, I won't have to live with a regret. So that was the kind of person I am. I was absolutely in control of my life. If I'm playing with my friend and they tell me I, don't, I can't do this, I will dare it. I dare anything. And that was the life I was living. Until someday somebody invited me. It was just an ordination service. A man of God was being ordained. And he convinced me that there will be rice and still very plenty. And I felt like that's a good way to spend my Saturday. So I decided to go. Of course, I got there late. I was sitting at the last row in the church. And the man of God ministering, I remember his name. I could picture him. He was wearing white flowing garment that day. His name is Reverend Emmanuel Ogundeji. He said to us that day, he said, there is somebody here. You have been in control of your life. Will you give your life to me? And I will make a beauty out of it. And I heard a voice in my hearing saying to me, it's you. And I looked back, I saw the wall of the church. Who is talking to me? That was the only thing I could remember. The next thing was, I saw myself in front. I was sobbing like a baby with things running down my nose, tears running down my face. And he prayed for me. And there was a turning, complete turnaround in my life. Before then, I was a drunkard. At the age of 14, I would go to compete with my mates. You can't finish this number of beer. And we would finish it and we would vomit. It was a reckless life. I, I, I wake up the next day, I will see bruises all over my body, and I will ask, what caused this? They say, oh, look at you, when you were rolling on the floor. I didn't know. So the, I was under the power of alcohol beyond what my life could manage. And I was being deceived by myself that was in control. That me man of myself. I want to control whatever it is I do. I hate people to control me. But that was the life I was living. So whoever had done this to me, has done my family a great joy has done my family a great job. And there's still somebody out there, a mother out there who is crying. And the salvation of the son they are crying about is tied to your hand. And you are feeling like the AC in the church is cool enough. I don't really care about what's outside. So I'm letting you all see that evangelism is beyond just doing the responsibility. It's actually bringing light to the city of Houston. Because every time you bring a soul out of darkness into light, we expand the light. We expand the light. And we don't need to fight darkness. We only need to just shine light. So rather than we fighting darkness, why can't we make more people light? And we discover that darkness in our society will begin to die down. Another boy is, is ruminating on the thought of going on his prey shooting again. Who will be the one that God will send? It's us. It's us. God is depending on us. God is depending on us. I always imagine if Osama bin Laden in his days, if he had been rescued and saved maybe when he was in school and somebody had brought him to see the light, can you imagine the catastrophe that the world would have been delivered from? And the same thing is still hanging today. The destiny of many people are hanging in a balance and it's because we have refused to walk. So it's not just a responsibility, it's a great privilege. Is a great privilege that we can partner with God and bring somebody who is confused to the place where they can begin to see direction again. Number four is to grow the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is interested in filling his church. The desire of the Father is that his house be filled. We can see that in what Jesus Christ taught us when he said, go to the byway, to the highway, bring them in that my house may be filled. So it's not just about DIC, it's about God's house must be filled. God's house must be filled. We have the assignment to keep growing the church. As long as there's still one life that is not saved outside, then we can't sit on our, on, on, in our comfort zone. We need to step out. And lastly, number five, why do we need to evangelize? Eternal destiny of many people are depending on this. Remember when the rich man so Lazarus, he said, please send one person to my brethren. Because what I'm hearing now, I never had this when I was alive. Can you send somebody? And he said, no, I have DIC there. They will do the job. So destiny of people 
are hanging on this. And I trust God that we will not fail him. Growth is not optional for the law, for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's commanded by Jesus Christ. It's not just about filling the church, it's about rescuing a life. And we can see that also in the book of Proverbs chapter 14 verse 28. In the multitude of people, the king is honored. So the king of glory also wants to be honored. He wants to be honored. He wants multitude to come to his house. Jesus said, other sheep I have. John chapter 10 verse 16. Other sheep I have that is not yet in this fold. Them also I must bring. So Jesus Christ is waiting to say those people that stay outside, that is part of this house, that we need to bring them. We need to bring them. Them also I must bring. It's a great commitment to the great commission that will grow a great church. It's a great commitment to the great commission that will grow a great church. So we cannot afford to be quiet. Who qualifies to share the good news? Second Corinthians chapter 1 and I read verses 3 and 4. Who is that person that qualifies to share the good news? Second Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God is not demanding from us what he has not given to us. What he's simply saying is this. Have you been forgiven? Have you been blessed? Have you been rescued? Have you been saved? Then you are qualified. Because that is the standard. That with the same comfort you have been comforted, then we need to also go out and comfort others. And I believe none of us hearing this message today is exempted from this. Have you been healed at any point in your life? That you prayed and God healed you? Then there's still somebody sick outside there who needs to hear that Jesus healed. Have you been delivered from accidents by calling the name of Jesus? Then somebody is still on the verge of perishing in an accident. But you need to hear also that Jesus has the capacity to deliver by the power in his blood. So how do I evangelize? How do I evangelize? Number one, share your story. Pastor has taught us this time and time again. Share your story. Don't be too theological and philosophical. Just simply share your story. I have also been a practitioner of this. I've said my story to people at different platforms, and people have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. That if God can turn you, this you, <laughs> to what we see today, then I can also trust my life into such a hand. And I tell you the truth, story is very powerful. Look at the blind man in the book of John chapter 9 verse 25. He didn't, he didn't tell them all the intricacies of the thing. He just said, I was blind. Now I can see. I have I don't know, but this is the Jesus who did it. And that's exactly what God is expecting of us. That we will share our story. What God has done for you. Let it be the strength that we use to salvage other people from the jaw of death. Number two, just invite people to church. Or if they are threatened by the size of the church, invite them to your DIG. Invite them to your DIG. Just invite them to church. From the Samaritan woman we see in the book of John chapter 4 verse 29. When he went to the city to go tell about what Jesus did. He didn't care to tell them all the discussion they had. How it happened. The scripture he quoted. He simply said, come and see. Come and see. And there are so many people who are out there today. They are clueless. You all just need to tell them, come and see. There is help in God. There is help in God. There is help in God. You are not preaching a theology that is read from the, from the encyclopedia. It's the one you have experienced. That's just a come and see. Then we can also use our social media and do. Don't use your social media to promote self. Use it to promote God. Have you posted the service today? If you have not done that, then you need to begin to see that as a priority. It's just simply, I didn't know how to do it. I asked people, they showed me, do this, swipe it here, share, post. And that's all. Somebody somewhere will stumble on my Facebook and he will hear the word. And that is how it should be. Not just to promote self. It's simple to grow the church. And how simple can it be? 
more than just inviting people to church. Every time pastor says, today is your very first time in this church, if you are not inviting people, then there will be nobody that will be putting up their hands. And it's when we have people coming newly that they will begin to give their life to Christ. And as they give their life to Christ, what happens? The members of the body of Christ will begin to increase. So we cannot overemphasize this. Invite people. One of us has been doing an excellent job at this. Today again she called me and she gave me two names that I need to follow up on. And I said to her, are you coming to church? She didn't know what I mean. It's sister for me. Practically every week she gets to invite somebody to church. And there's no excuse of, oh, I don't have a car. We quickly call our transport team. They will go and pick them. I want to encourage us all. Let's do this. It's simple. Come to my church. Like today she said she was talking to the person. And the person said, oh my God, you are God sent. I've been believing God for a church to go. I don't even know. And imagine she has kept quiet. Or she has just talked about her latest version. Or just talk about uh, what's happening and trending on the social media. The life would have just slipped off. So we cannot afford to be quiet. Invite people to church. A crowd is not a church. I'm not disputing that statement. But it takes a crowd to actually grow the church. Jesus Christ will have the multitude come. Multitude is all manner of people. But it's from that same multitude that the members of the body of Christ will, will rise. Because we see that when Jesus Christ started, they came in ones, in twos, and eventually 5,000, 7,000. And by the time he was leaving, even though it's only one person he called, by the time he was leaving, there were more than 120 in the upper room. So that is how it is. And the 120 are giving back to over 2 billion people today. And that is the way it is. Let's just keep inviting people. Jesus' ministry actually showed us that. Imagine how many people are out there today. They are actually on a banana peel in a slope to hell. I checked up statistics and I discovered that last year alone, not for COVID, COVID is an exceptional year. Just in 2021, over 3.4 million people died in America. And pastor always asks us, have you thought about where they are heading for? Okay, that's too far. America is too far. Let's come down to Texas. In one year alone in Texas, average of 200,000 people died in one year. And that comes about 15,000 every month of people dying. Is that too far? Let's come to Houston. In Houston alone, in Houston alone, 15,000 people died every year. That's over 1,000 people every month. Over 1,000 people every month. Have you asked ourselves, where are they going? Where are they going? Is that a plus to the kingdom of God, a loss to the kingdom of God? I remember this is the assignment that God has given us. He has given us the work of reconciliation. If we don't tell them, they won't know. How will they hear if nobody tells them? And how will somebody tell them if nobody is sent? So God has positioned us. He has sent us on this assignment. I, I mentioned the example of a man, uh, the professor that I know, that was uh, following Guru Maharaj with all his intellectual capacity. He brought it down to tending flower. Why? Because his mind had been lost. His mind had been lost. I also have a friend. His name is Sulaiman. Uh, we were in school together. This guy was exceptionally brilliant. Exceptionally brilliant. He was working with French Embassy. He is from Cordova. I was my classmate. He was working with French Embassy before he came for his master's. He was so brilliant that every time we are wasting time in asking questions, is the man that the professor will always point us to. Guys, organize tutorial with Sulaiman. He will fix it for you. And true, true, he will fix it. Exceptionally sharp. I took my time. In one of these evenings, he used to take me a personal class at night at times. I said to him, Sulaiman, I need you to come to fellowship tomorrow. And he said to me, leave church, leave church. You know, you don't understand. Life, you just need to be organized. Everything will fall in place. And I pushed it, I pushed it. And then Sulaiman pushed me aside. But after we left school, just barely a year after I left school, he, was, he settled down in New York. The guy was doing well for himself. I just heard that Sulaiman committed suicide. The pain, the pain in my heart, he has two children already. The pain in my heart, I could not fathom it. 
The first thing that first came to my mind, that kind of brain died. The guy, even the professor, we asked him, come and explain this. Because the way you explain it, I think it's, it's clearer that way. He committed suicide. I can't place it. I called some friends and said, what happened? Nobody could place it. That is what I mean by people are on a slippery ground. But not just a slippery ground, they are on a banana peel. So the slope is sharper. If the life is not in Christ, it's actually full of crises. I, I just stumbled on the news yesterday. The richest man in the world, Elon Musk, the daughter just declared that I want to cut herself away from the father because she's not a transgender. I'm saying this to not be deceived by the facade. Oh, this one, this kind of worthy people, I can't talk to them. They need God. Please, don't be deceived by the look. Don't be deceived by what they drive. What is driving them is more important. If not Christ is the one driving them, they are heading for nowhere but hell. So we need to be deliberate. There is a crisis out there that needs an urgency. It needs an urgency. And with all his wealth, do you think he will go home smiling and happy? No. There's a pain. He's nothing in the heart. And such a pain, it takes Christ, the bombing Gilead, to hear such a pain. Who will take gospel to them? And remember when the Bible says, go to the hands of the world. Your world begins from the place where you have influence. There's a world of nothing. There's a world of science. There's a world of teaching. So in the place of your influence, begin to declare the light. Let people know that there is hope in God. So many people are banned with alcohol, or alcohol. Some are banned by nicotine. Some are, are banned by drug addiction. Some are banned by sicknesses. Some are banned by poverty, sexual perversion. Some are confused in their mind. I heard of a lady who was in the plane and was giving a dog a breast to suck. How do you explain that? Confusion. A lady bringing out her own breast to suck for a dog. Things happening outside there, when you understand the depth or the rate at which the enemy is working, then you can't afford to sleep another day without telling somebody that there is hope in God. There is hope in God. If you see people as Jesus sees them, then you will not be quiet. You people just saw multitude, but he said he saw them as sheep without shepherd. They are harassed. Harassed means there is a repeated attack just weighing them down win them down. And that's why we see that ever, much ever than before, suicide rates are gone up. People are weighed down by many things. And it's only the living church is actually the last hope of the dying world. We can't afford to be quiet. They are most miserable, no matter what they have, no matter who they are, if they are not in Christ. They are most miserable. Because it's only in this world they have hope. Some of them don't even have hope. In this world. So we need to be deliberate and we need to put some urgency into what we do. Christianity is not a secret to be kept. It's a story of salvation to be told. Christianity is not just what we come to church to hear. It is what we go from church to share with the world. We must know that the world needs what we have. The world needs what we have. The world needs what we have. Not just our charity work. The world needs to hear that there is hope in Christ. The world needs to know that there is a way out, out of their predicament. We must not be insensitive to the groaning of the people around us. Many people are dying daily and they are sleeping into Christless eternity. Christless eternity. So let's be conscious and begin to walk as the urgency demand. Revelation chapter 12 verse 12 as we begin to wind down. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore be glad, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to you, O heart, and see. For the devil has come down to you in fierce anger. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. The devil has come down to you in fierce anger, fury, because he knows that he has only a short time left. In other words, the time is running out. I call it, we are, in a, we are in the injury time. If you know about the soccer game, they give them 45 minutes for first half. And then because of the 
lapses of maybe ball stepped out and somebody was wounded, all those delay, they fathom and just put together and say, you know what, this is the number of time. So at that point, even if you are winning, let's say it's one go down, and the injury time is two minutes. Within that two minutes, every soccer team will put their best leg forward. You know why? These two minutes can make or mar whatever it is we have achieved. Can I also tell you, in this present age, we are at the injury time. From that passage we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, it is clear that Satan is on rampage. It's clear that the time is short. And Satan is putting his best feet forward. And believers cannot afford to leave the work of evangelism to those who feel like doing it. To those who are the, re they are the evangelic team member. It's that time we wake up and we begin to see the urgency that if the enemy of our soul, he knows that the time is short and he's putting his best feet forward, then we must also march with him. We must put our best feet forward and put intentionality into what we do. But let me tell you something. The most important human factor in evangelism is prayer. Prayer is the most important human factor in evangelism. Pastor Omi said this, and it's, 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 it's such, a, such a revolutionary truth for me, that your prayer has the capacity to put the hand of that body you are, the act of the person you have a burden about, in the hand of God. So it's our prayer that will cause our harvest feet to be ripened. So that when we go out, we not go out and people will begin to argue. No, okay, why is Jesus this? Why is he not a prophet? No, it's because prayer had not gone forth. If prayer had adequately gone forth, the soul would be ripened. Before you even say, hey, they say, yes, I will follow you. Because of the investment of prayer. How much of prayer are you investing for your family members who are here to be saved? How much of prayer are we praying for friends and colleagues who are here to be saved? How much of prayer are we praying even for our neighbors who are not yet saved? Second Kings chapter 7 verse 9. Second Kings chapter 7 verse 9. And I want to read from the complete Jewish Bible. Second Kings chapter 7 verse 9. It's a story of the leper where there was famine in Samaria. And at this point, God had given them the privilege to step into the camp of the enemy, and they discovered that the enemy they were fighting were no longer there. So they were able to eat and everything. They took a lot of spoil. And this is now the conclusion that they made. Second Kings chapter 7, verse 9. But finally they said to each other, what we are doing is wrong. Let me put it this way. What we are doing is not good. At a time of good news like this, we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. How many people know that God is set to encounter his people in divine encounter 2022? Then, if we keep it to ourselves, then this word is applicable to us. Please let me preach to the person sitting next to you. What we are doing is not good. This is the time of good news. And we need to share it. We need to share it. He said, what we are doing is wrong. At a time of good news like this, we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. If we wait even till morning, we will hand only punishment. So come on. Come on. Let's go to the city of Houston. Come on. Let's go out and begin to declare that God is our work in this place. By the grace of God on Saturday, God is giving us the opportunity to come together as a church to go out. Don't give the excuse that the, mm, it's going to be too hot. I checked the weather forecast. It's 101, it's 102. Can I tell you the truth? We won't spend more than one hour outside there. But do you know that if you decide to say because of one hour of going under heat, somebody will spend eternity in hell. How hot will 101 degree will be compared to somebody who will be in hell? Not for one hour, not for one day, but in eternity. So you can't give excuse not to be here on Saturday. You cannot give excuse. God is counting on us. We need to pray and plan to attend. That will be one of the most rewarding things that you will do this year. Refusal to evangelize is the height of selfishness. It's technically saying, I've been saved. I don't care what's happening to other people. They can go to hell. Remember, you are the light of the world. If you hide your light, darkness will keep spreading. And many will keep stumbling into hell. Don't complain 
Just make sure you begin to do your part by inviting people to church. Invite people to church. My time is up, but I want to share this thought with us. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 10 and 11. When we evangelize, this is one of the things we stand to gain. There are several rewards to it. Isaiah 58, verses 10 and 11. Okay. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. What the scripture is saying is this. If you extend your soul to the hungry, there is no worse hunger than the hunger for salvation. Somebody might be well fed. If they go to hell, it's, it's, it's useless. So we need to take care of their spiritual hunger. Every time I have the privilege of driving past a beggar, I will always wander my glass and give them something. And as I'm giving them the thing, I will add a track to it. And one day my son asked me, I said, the money I give him can't help him. What really can help him is to know what I know. When he knows what I know, he won't be here begging because there's enough. God is inexhaustible. There's enough in the kingdom if he can come into the kingdom. So the same thing we need to begin to see this way. And all these beautiful promises will begin to find full expression. Your light will break forth. It says that your bone will be strengthened. No more sickness in your body as you join the saints of God to declare light in the city of Houston. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let's stand up as we pray. Let's stand up as we pray. I want us to take this prayer. That as we go out on Saturday, Father, we bind every strong man that wants to resist the invasion of light. We bind every strong man that wants to resist the invasion of light. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we bind every strong man that wants to resist the invasion of light. In the name of Jesus Christ, we command, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted, the everlasting door, that the King of glory may come in. Into the city of Houston, to the state of Texas, in this United States, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have brought us here, Lord, to be the gate into heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, every gate that want to resist our expansion. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pull them down. We pull them down. In the name of Jesus, we bind the strong man. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. We give you glory and praise, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. In closing tonight, I want us to take this hymn. It's a hymn of prayer. And as we take it, our Father and the Lord will be coming on the altar. It's a hymn of prayer. Very powerful hymn. Please, can we project it so that we can all follow? My voice is very good. If I sing, all of you will be dancing. But Brian, may you help me? Hmm. May we be a shining light to the nations, a shining light to the peoples of the earth, till the whole world sees the glory of your name may your pure light shine through us may we bring a word of hope to the nations a word of life to the peoples of the earth till the whole world sins there's salvation through your name may your mercy flow through us amen amen that was powerful that was awesome before we take the communion tonight, just to buttress some point, look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. The Bible says, you know, we can't claim that we are not involved. He said, deliver Proverbs 24 from verse 11, 11 and 12. He said, deliver those who are drawn towards death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Hold them back. 
Verse 12. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighed the heart consider it? If you play lackadaisical attitude, you don't care attitude. After all, I've been delivered. I don't need anybody to, you know, whether they are saved, they are not saved. It's not my portion. That's their own. Does not he who weigh the heart consider it? He who keep your soul, your own soul, the one who keep it, does he not know it? And he will, will he not render to each man according to his deed? Does that make sense to us? So, that leads us to prayer again today. That as we will be going out on Saturday, Psalm 2, I believe they read that one to us at the beginning of our prayer tonight. Psalm 2, verse 8. He said, Hearts of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the hands of the heart for your possession. Say, Father, we call on you today. Release upon everyone grace for evangelism. Grace for soul winning. That as we go this Saturday, O oh Lord, and as we begin to talk to people about you, open their heart in the name of Jesus. Give us the city of Houston, beginning from our neighborhoods, our cities, our state, our nation. Give it to us, O oh Lord. Make us a soul winning church, a soul winning individual. Grant us the grace even to be a profitable church, a profitable believers are profitable children of the most high God to your kingdom. Give us the nation. Come on now. He said when we ask, he will give it to us. Put your word in our heart, O oh Lord, and in our mouth. Give us the grace to speak as your oracle in the name of Jesus. Give us the grace to speak as your oracle in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you know what prayer does for you when you commit the soul of people you are ministering to or you are going to minister to, to the hand of God? You are speaking the problem that is going on in their life by defined, you know, utterance. They don't, you know, they don't know you. You've never met them before. But as you open your mouth, the Holy Spirit takes over and is revealing the secret of their heart. That's one of the ways. How did you know about this thing? Oh, I didn't know, but it's the Holy Spirit. So you're going to pray, say, Lord, anytime I'm speaking to sinners, put your word in my mouth. Put your word in my mouth. The word that will convince them. The word that will touch their heart. Come on now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Make me a soul winner. Make me a soul winner for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. And as this soul has been warm, bring them to your church DLC. Bring them to your church DIC. Establish them in your kingdom and in your church. Let your name be glorified. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Finally tonight, if I become a soul winner, what is in need for me? God has never called on any seed of Jacob to seek him in vain. Where you are working presently, you are trading your hours with them. And at the end of the week, you get what we call a paycheck. So when you subscribe your time for evangelism to seek God, look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said. I believe in the book of John chapter 15 verse 16. What is in need for me if I subscribe to this venture? What is my take-home blessing? Verse 16 of John 
from first, I mean, chapter 15, verse 16, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you. Appointed you. It, it, it's a letter of, okay, you have gone through the interview. This is your appointment letter. Jesus is saying that, and when you, you know, where you are working now, the day you got that particular job, they gave you an appointment letter that you are qualified to be working in this organization. To be working in this organization. So Jesus is saying now, you did not choose me, but I chose to say I've been chosen. He said, I choose and chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fr fruit should remain. Now, what is the need? If my if I begin to bear fruit, if my fruit remain, you now say whatever you ask the Father in my name. Somebody say blank check. Whatever you ask the Father in my name. Now, remember, you got to work. If you are not a worker, there is no future. If you are not a worker in this kingdom, you don't have anything to lay claim of. My assignment for you, I have given you an appointment letter. My assignment for you, go out there and win souls. He said, go ye into all the world and make a disciple. Now when you do that, and you're not, it's not just, okay, I, I, I minister to you, you gave your life to Jesus. That is the beginning. You must see to it that they are fully established in the church and in the kingdom. And the father now said, I mean, the master now said, now this is the check I'm giving to you. Whatever you want, write it there. Whatever you want, I will grant it. He said, whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. I pray for you, you will not lose your reward. Lift up your hands. Say, Father, I want to know you more. Give me the grace never to be a lazy worker, but to be a productive one, inviting people to your kingdom, populating your kingdom and the populate hell. And I know you will never fail in performing the miracle, in performing what you have promised in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Uh, tonight, before we share the communion, how many of you would think that Pastor Kola used to be drunk? I'm hearing it for the very, very first time. That is to tell you that those who look innocent, so, so... As if on Azumi, let's check. And you are laughing too. Maybe one of these days we will tell the Holy Spirit under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You will just be telling us your secret of the past. How many of you know Pastor Shola? Pastor Shola, the uh, pastor in Pearland. The day he, the Holy Spirit moved on him too. He said he loved the man called Tupac. I said, You? Tupac, you don't know that rapper in New York. That they killed some years. I said, you, Tupac? He said that was his best. Hey, hex drunkard. Only God knows what you have done. But the joy of it is that God does not need to consult your past. Are you following what I'm talking about? He said, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Somebody say, all things. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming. Things are different now. Something happens to me when I gave my life to Jesus. Things I loved before. before. Things I loved before. Has now, passed away. Okay, now. Things, things I, I love are more. Has come to stay. Amen. Things are different now. Something, Something happened, happened to me when, when I, I gave did. my life to Jesus. him. Amen.
So no matter what you have been doing, don't let the devil tempt you with your past or just to condemn you that you of all people with all the atrocity you have committed in the past. Satan, shut up your mouth. That was my past. That one is dead. This is a new me in Christ. So the whole color drunk is dead. Only God know what this young man has done too. The grammar, am I right? No, you that are smiling at me, only God knows what you have done. Only God know. Marvelous, marvelous. If we are to go to your busting days, God has forgiven you. <laughs> Amen. I'm looking for somebody who looking like a, like a saint now. Amen. Stretch forth your hands. Father, this wall that we had today will not stand against any of us in the day of judgment. We pray that as we partake in this communion, passion for souls, we engulf every one of us. And you will be proud of us. And as you are speaking, you will be confirming your words. You will be bringing souls through us to your kingdom. And you will establish them in your church. Whatever may be the desire of everyone here tonight, on site, online, as we lift this communion up, we sanctify them. Those needs are granted. The desires are met. Anyone sick in his or her body will come against that sickness, that disease, away with you in Jesus' name. Anyone contemplating suicide, I cause that spirit of suicide in the name of Jesus. Anyone being discouraged of life, Jesus is life. And in Jesus, we never get discouraged. I release the spirit of excitement in the mighty name of Jesus. The world are saying there is a casting down. As for us, there is a lifting up. And our path will continue to shine ever brighter. None of us will have a better yesterday. This communion is blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody say, come on.